welcome you to the fourth uh, annual conference that we've had for student advocates. We have found that this is a great opportunity to bring together people who every day spend their lives thinking about how we make sure that more Hoosier students are successful. Uh, this year's conference theme really focuses on the theme of inform, empower, and advance. And I think those words kind of say it all based on what I know those of you in the audience do every day. So thank you for spending a couple days at a very busy time of the year to be with us to think about the strategies behind the commitment that we all have around student success. Of course, we care about access. We, you know, unless we get students to enter into post-secondary, we don't have the promise of them having that uh, degree at the end. But then once they get there, we're all focused on making sure they complete. And the success strategies that we're going to talk about today are what we work on along the way to make sure that students make the right choices, that they persist, and that they complete. So I know as you've had a chance to look at the agenda, it's rich uh, with all kinds of opportunities for you to choose those sessions that are most pertinent to you as you plan your days. And as I look around the room, I know many of you, and I'm encouraged by the fact that we've brought together this great group of people, and I'm very grateful to Strata, Strata for helping us do this, to allow us to be able to offer this to you today um, because of the generosity of Strata. So in a few moments, I'm going to moderate a panel with uh, the folks who are at me at the, ta with the, me at the table here in the front. Um, really talking about some of the ways in which we are, we work to make sure that communities and employers and policymakers and all of us are aligning our efforts together. But I'd like to make just a couple comments before we get, begin, just to bring you up to date a little bit on, about where we are on the commission. I hope you know, I think most, most of you do, that we have a big goal in Indiana that 60% of Hoosiers would have a quality degree or credential beyond high school. That includes quality certificates, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, and beyond. And the good news is we're making progress. We're at about 43.4%. You can see every tenth of a uh, point I count on because it means that there's another there students behind those. And we're making progress. We're still a little below the, the national average, but I would say that we are closing that gap uh, in a more expedient manner than many of our colleagues in other states around the nation. And the big goal is a goal that we would reach by 2025. We know that in order to get to that goal, we can't do it in just the traditional way, that we need to really be successful with students who may not have thought about college as being in their career plan before. Um, because we knew that in 2013, and based on the wisdom of the members of our commission, uh, we decided to set an achievement goal as well, which was to close the achievement gap by 2025 and cut it in half by 2018. Many argued that that was an unreachable goal, to which our response was it was unacceptable not to have that goal. And we have, in fact, uh, meet, we've reached our 2018 benchmark of cutting it in half. One could argue, and I suppose I will, that that was the easier part, that now doing the next part of this is going to be more difficult. At some of our campuses, we're on target to do that. Uh, others are going to have to step up their efforts a little bit more. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to look at our equity report, which came out this year, I think it's probably the richest data dive that you have on equity issues in the country right now. We really looked at all of those issues to see what we needed to do to actually deal with equity to close the achievement gap. And it um, just came out this last summer. We're committed to continuing to do it as we do all of our annual reports. Um, but, but I think it really shows um, what we need to do in this area and where we need to do it better. Um, in addition, a couple other things that we're working on. Um, we've been really working on the transitions from P-12 to college. Uh, Superintendent McCormick and I have been co-chairing a group, really it's called the Post-Secondary Transitions Group, and it really was to try to look at what do we need to do to blur the lines between high school and college in particular, and where do we have gaps in that area? Um, and so both the Commission for Higher Education and the State Board of Education actually voted within the last month on three major recommendations that had to do with transitions. One, and not surprisingly, we know that many students who are not successful when they enter college or need remediation need it in math. So we've done a good job uh, redesigning math at Ivy Tech 
and to really make it more appropriate for the career pathways that people have. And we're now looking at how we do that at the high school level as well. And the introduction of a new uh, senior year transition math course that we will be piloting at 10 schools around, uh, the, around the state to see what we can do with students who are not college ready for the, for the courses that are in our core transfer library. So stay tuned for that. We think it's going to be very helpful to make sure that students actually see math as facilitating their career as opposed to being an obstacle to success. Another major focus, and it would be impossible for you not to know this if you know anything that the governor has been involved with or that Blair has been involved with, is really has to do with making sure that adults have an opportunity to fully participate in the economy. And we know that uh, more than ever, uh, adults are needing to come back and either complete what they started or get some sort of a quality credential. Blair's going to talk about that a little bit more, but at the commission, we've actually been leading on our You Can Go Back campaign for uh, students, uh, for adults who have some college and no degree, and, and we've had about 14,000 who have come back under that program, and now we have our Workforce Ready grant where the state commits to pay for a quality credential certificate if you come back and complete that. So I think the combination of these programs sends a strong message to adult Hoosiers that Indiana and employers are committed to making sure that there's a way for you to come back. Um, the employer training grant is very successful in that way as well. So you'll hear about these initiatives and others throughout the next few day, the next couple days, but I thought it would be important just to provide a little context about what the commission is engaged with you in partnership with you. With that, I'd like to welcome today's panelists to the stage. And this, these three have been really great innovators in community connections and higher education. They're going to join me for a panel. John Burnett uh, is the CEO of the Community Education Coalition in Columbus, Indiana, and at least three other titles that I know he has that he will explain to you. Um, which is great news. Uh, Lauren Robel is the provost and executive vice president at Indiana University Bloomington. Uh, the, uh, members of our commission had a chance to hear from her about the rural initiative that she's leading. You're going to be very excited when you hear about that. And Blair Milo, who is our first secretary of career connections and talent. I can't keep track of where she is. She's in uh, every corner of the state nearly every day, really leading on some of the issues that I highlighted before. So with that, I'm going to join, and I think we have just one mic that we're going to share. Is it on? Yep. All right. Should I turn mine off? Uh, you'll keep yours on. Okay. So John, uh, and then I'll come join you. Um, what I'm going to have everybody do is I'm going to ask each of them to start, and rather than me make a lengthy introduction, I'm going to ask them to share a little bit about why they think they were invited to participate today and a little bit about what they do. And John, we're going to start with you, share a little bit about what you do at the Community Education Coalition or the other hats that you wear. Um, I know that um, you've experienced a, a lot of success in the Columbus area in southern Indiana, and because of that, he's actually become, and his organization's national leaders, um, to actually share their story throughout, this, throughout the country as well. So specifically, as you introduce yourself, share a little bit about what you think community partnership looks like and what, how it plays in shape, shaping the educational outcomes in Indiana. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. And anytime you ask me to do something, I'm happy to do it. Um, for those of you who may not know, and most of you may not, the Community Education Coalition was formed in 1997, actually out of the business community because there was a recognition that in order for the community to be successful, that the business community needed to come alongside education partners and community partners to really to improve the human condition, specifically connecting education, uh, the economy, and then the places we call home. So the Community Education Coalition, of which I've been a part since 1999, it's hard to imagine now, um, is really dedicated to connecting the learning system to economic opportunity through placemaking. And that's been our mission since uh, the very beginning, and it continues to be our, our mission. Um, I think the part that seems to be resonating a lot is that none of us can do this work alone. I have the privilege, actually, of 
kind of sitting up here with really cool people that are um, doing um, more than their part to make things happen in our state, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, the Education Coalition started by bringing together the community of Columbus, bringing together education partners, IU Purdue, Columbus, Ivy Tech, Purdue Polytechnic now, and also our school districts. Uh, but along the way, what we found out is that we're not an island. And so we have to actually connect into a broader region, in this case, uh, rural southeast Indiana. Um, so Lauren and I have had some conversations about rural, uh, the nature of how um, rural work is sometimes different than working in urban work. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time connecting, uh, and I know the mantra now, 22 high schools, four Ivy Tech sites, uh, six work, one centers, IUPUC, Ivy Tech, and Purdue Polytechnic now, all into one cohesive learning system. We've been at it um, in the region going on, this will be the 12th year coming up, and it's called ECHO, what's called ECHO 15. Never put a date in your name unless you're willing to change your name. <laughs> Um, and so we have actually organized uh, several networks, uh, manufacturing, healthcare, and IT uh, set of networks that we're now merging together because there's so much uh, interconnectivity with the skills. And then uh, underpinning that is attainment. You talked about equity, the importance of serving all students, students of color, um, a low income. Uh, we are. Uh, really challenged in our region to make sure that we help every student uh, rise up, lift up uh, every student. So um, that's a little bit about who we are and the, now we find ourselves, uh, it's kind of 21 year overnight sensation I guess, um, <laughs> is, is working with uh, Lumina Foundation and with uh, Cummins Foundation and others teaching civic engagement through what we call Civic Labs. So, bringing together people from the public, the private, and the social sector, really to address any key issue, but especially for the audience here today, connecting learning to economic opportunity in places we call home. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, and you're gonna hear from the other two as well, and you certainly know this because of the things that you do every day, it really is about human talent at this point, and what we're really talking about is the right fit for people. We've spent a lot of time, and we can need to continue to do so in recent years, um, talking about the challenges in um, all corners of the state, and, and especially those who have been left behind in urban areas. Um, and so, uh, among the many things that Lauren has done, she, as you'll know by reading in the in the program, that you know she was uh, she led the law school, um, and she's been at IU for a long time. Um, so you're welcome to share anything you want with us, but we, in, in particular, uh, wanted to know a little bit about the efforts that you have with the Rural Initiative. One, because it's important, but two, because it really does talk about this connection between higher education and the communities, and the disconnect that many people feel about higher education from the communities. Uh, so share a little bit about what you're doing, what you've done, and anything that you think might be especially important for this group to hear. Oh, thank you so much. First, thank you for letting me come today. I'm thrilled to be able to talk about this initiative any chance I get. And it's wonderful to be up here with people who ha are so focused on the ways in which higher education can connect effectively to the advancement of our state and our communities. So I'm going to talk just for a couple of minutes about this initiative, uh, the IU Center for Rural Engagement. It is an initiative that, that is designed to connect Indiana University in Bloomington, which many people think correctly is a, uh, an enormous r residential un undergraduate institution, uh, to connect its great research and its students and its teaching mission to the rural parts of our state, particularly in southwest central Indiana. And so the, our mission is really to make the, the connections between communities in the state who can use our um, expertise and can use our students and the issues and challenges that those communities are facing 
the opportunities that they have, make that connection seamless. And I'll, I'll give you just one quick example. Uh, Commissioner Lubbers has heard this. When I was going around to lots of communities in the southern part of the state and asking, what kinds of challenges are you facing? And many, many of them are well known to people in this room. But one community said to me, we're really, um, we, we need skilled nursing facilities for our older community members. We don't have, when people get older, they have to leave. And I, I myself, when I was driving to French Lick last, saw a sign out in front of a house saying, got to sell, too old, have to move. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought, well, gosh, we can't start a skilled nursing facility, but we have one of the best groups in the country working on aging in place using technology. And how would this community ever find that group over in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering? The answer is this. <laughs> so we set this up, the Center for a Rural Engagement with a wonderful uh, grant from the Lilly Endowment to really partner well with rural communities to improve Hoosier lives and to bring everything IU has, its research, its teaching, and its service to those communities effectively. I could talk a lot about what we do and how we do it, and particularly in the, um, in the research area, but I'm going to skip forward and just talk about one thing that we do, and that is community-engaged teaching. Right now, we have the largest rural university teaching partnership in the nation. Does that surprise you to think of Bloomington in that role? This uh, teaching partnership worked all of last year. The way it works is it spends an entire year working with a, a set of communities. It spent all of last year working with the communities in Lawrence County, and it involved 550 students out in those communities. And that's the kind of work that those students in their classes did. The classes negotiated with the, with the community and the community leadership to set up a set of uh, projects on which the community could use expertise and help, promise some deliverables, and this is what they did. Among the things that they did uh, in, are included something called a uh, Complete Streets Initiative, which allows everyone in the community of Bedford to use the streets no matter what their ability level. And that was done by the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and it was passed by the Bedford City Council uh, at the end of this project. So what does this kind of work, deep work, in the community do uh, for the community? Well, it gives a lot of uh, free consulting, you might say. It brings a lot of expertise into a community, but it does a lot of other things, too. For one thing, it makes Indiana University Bloomington feel and, and actually be a lot closer to rural communities in the state. Those gates I started out with may seem like they're wide open, but for lots of people in rural parts of the state, Bloomington feels a long way away and maybe a little scary. And having all these students in communities for an entire year working in their classes, working with community members, working with the schools, public health agencies, all of that makes Bloomington seem a lot closer. What else does it do? And this year we're working in Orange County. We're already on track to double the number of uh, projects and students and faculty members. This is just the fall semester and you can see everything that people are working on from you know, bike path planning to, uh, to rural history to accessible playgrounds to a dark skies designation. But this is the kind of thing that happens when our students get out into these communities. Lauren Travis came from uh, Washington State. She is now here in Indiana working, a graduate of SPIA, the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and through this, uh, this project, she decided she wants to stay in Indiana and work on local government issues. 
this person here, Michael Etter, is a gra also a graduate of the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. He's from Indiana, he's from right here in Indianapolis, but he was planning to go to Florida when he graduated. As a result of working in this set of community projects, he's decided that he'd rather apply his talents to the southern uh, part of our state. I'm gonna back up just one, because I think I'm, well. Michael is pretty, um, uh, he's, there are many Michaels and Laurens in this project. And it's a way that Indiana University can contribute to stopping the brain drain. The last piece I want to talk about is just quickly this student engagement piece, IU Core. We have hundreds of community engaged classes and organizations on the Bloomington campus. But again, how do communities all over the state ever find them? You need everything from expertise in your IT to a business plan to just a bunch of hands to help you paint a church. How do you find all of those 40 some odd thousand students on the Bloomington campus. IU Core is our answer to that. It's a way for communities to just say, this is what, put their hands up and say, this is what we need, and for us to get our students into those communities to help. So I could talk about this all day, but I'll stop right there, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about it today. And pass the mic to Blair. Those of you who are in the back of the room, there are seats up here if you'd like seats. Um, so anybody who comes in, don't be shy. Um, and those of you who are um, from urban Indiana in particular who are feeling jealous right now um, because of this initiative in southern Indiana and the work, you should know that many of these great efforts are taking place. For example, there are two uh, schools of education. There's one in Bloomington and there's one at IUPUI with a focus in Indianapolis more on uh, those who are preparing for urban education, which I think is very important as well. Purdue Polytechnic is operating in Indianapolis. So um, I don't want you to think this is only about rural. It's just that we have not really focused on rural Indiana at anything that's been that w any part of our focus. So the, over the next day and a half, you will have an opportunity to talk about all of these programs, but I thought it was really important uh, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, and I, I sort of made reference to this, because in rural Indiana and rural America, there is great skepticism about higher education and how we actually increase its value um, to Hoosiers and Americans all over. And Blair, you have the opportunity to travel north, south, east, and west, talk to employers in all parts of the state. Before you talk, do that, talk a little bit about just your background and how you ended up where you are today and what frames your thinking about the work that you're doing every day. Well, thank you, Teresa, our commissioner lovers, for the uh, opportunity to join you and uh, this incredible team here. And uh, it's it's great to be able to share a little bit of the, the journey that we've had thus far. Uh, I'll give maybe a little bit of insight into some of the background of the career connections and talent model, which leads into uh, to your question overall around how we're connecting uh, individuals with those education opportunities, the why behind some of it, as you, specifically as you talk about the big goal that's been set overall. And and uh, so the, the career connections and talent model, uh, I'll, I'll give by a, a sort of separate way of background that uh, I came into this role having served as the mayor of LaPorte, Indiana. LaPorte, also known as the hub of awesome, for those of you who uh, have, have been there or, or heard a little bit about it. Uh, and so the... My, my foray into the world of workforce really came from the aspect that there were so many great things happening in the hub uh, as we were growing businesses, growing opportunity in many different capacities, but we were growing jobs, but we couldn't get people into these jobs. And uh, as I was then digging further into where are the barriers, what are the disconnects here, started realizing these are different kinds of jobs that require different types of education and skills to be able to take advantage as particularly technology has really influenced what these, these different types of roles are bringing forward. Uh, now, certainly positive news that comes with it that there are higher wages associated with many of these positions uh, and some really dynamic career opportunities, but we were struggling to be able to ensure uh, that our citizens were able to connect up with these, these different types of jobs to even be aware that they, they were possibilities for them and to then be able to have access to some of the training to be able to step into these roles. And so uh, I've, I've had the, the opportunity
opportunity to have conversations around this uh, with, with many members of our team in Indianapolis, with uh, the governor as well. And uh, so it was July, August timeframe of 2017 uh, that the creation of the uh, Career Connections and Talent uh, position was created to be able to, to bridge across some of the, the silos that have existed both within and outside of government uh, to be able to work across these different discipline areas to bring together business, education, local government, nonprofits, philanthropy, uh, to be able to work towards building uh, partnerships, building, and as, as uh, John and I talk about regularly, the system, uh, to be able to help facilitate the process for, for individuals to connect up to the existing career opportunities as well as to then be able to prepare for what the future of, of work is going to bring forward and so that as we look at our talent pipelines overall. And uh, so I will, I will say that I think both, whether you're central Indiana, southern Indiana, uh, that the Colts fans probably had a pretty good day yesterday, or if you're up in north, uh, the Bears fans had a pretty good day yesterday. So probably everybody in the room that's football fans is happy to be able to, to connect up with thinking about football today. I'm sort of the free safety uh, that I get to work across all the different agencies and I get to, as, as uh, Commissioner Lubbers mentioned, that I get to work with uh, many different communities and regional partners to work across these different areas to be able to uh, build the partnerships, build the system, to then be able to help serve our students, our citizens, to connect up with the, the current opportunities and the future roles as well. And uh, as, as uh, Commissioner Lovers mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, big initiative for Governor Holcomb as a part of his agenda from the onset of his role in, in leadership has been building a 21st century uh, workforce. And key to that has been our next level jobs programs that you heard a little bit about the Workforce Ready Grants, uh, where there's an opportunity for individuals to have 100% tuition coverage for high-wage, high-demand certificates. Uh, and those are in our five high-wage, high-demand categories of health and life sciences, business and IT, uh, advanced manufacturing, transportation and logistics, and building and construction. Uh, and to date, uh, we rolled those out in August of 2017, I remember, because that was day one for me <laughs> that we were, we were out on the tour. And uh, since then, we have had uh, over 11,000 enrollments uh, as a result of Next Level Jobs, and we're now at actually over 4,000 completions uh, in those certificate areas. So uh, exciting to see the, the growth and the, the success of that program. Uh, as a part of the Next Level Jobs portfolio, we also have of an employer training grant where employers are able to access some training reimbursement dollars uh, for training that falls into those uh, top five high wage, high demand areas as well. We also include agriculture in that. And thus far, we've had over uh, 400 businesses who have taken advantage of that. And we have uh, thousands more Hoosiers who are trained uh, through that uh, program as well. And so part of the initiative moving into 2019 will be to, to grow opportunities with in the next level jobs programs to be able to to continue to increase the success that we've seen there that as we look at the the future of work and seeing that that goal the big goal of, of 20 uh, by 2025 and 60 percent of these positions that the the key piece to remember around that is because the jobs are going to require this and as I have the conversations in uh, some of the areas where there there may be some reluctance on wanting to connect up to these future training opportunities I think when we we see what what's driving the change and the reason why we talk about this so much uh, is that then we want to ensure that everyone has access to to training to be able to to step into some of these positions or to step over into them if they may be adults who are in the workforce already and who are going to require some additional training uh, to be able to, to leverage this this technology or uh, the aspects that are coming from the change with a global marketplace or just demographic trends that we see across the workforce. Uh, and so it's, it's my pleasure to be able to, to work with so many partners uh, within the governor's workforce cabinet and uh, also across the state uh, as I get to spend time out in communities and regions. Uh, I just checked and I think that of 
of actual meetings that we've convened in each county. We've made it to 43 thus far, uh, and so we are still working our way around to get to every county to be able to have an in-depth conversation around what are the needs that, that need to take place here, how do we ensure that business, uh, education, and all the different uh, partners are at the table to ensure that we're building the right system. So you can hear that we're doing a lot. Uh, and employers are stepping up, you know, higher education is engaging more in uh, continuous learning, communities are more involved. I want to probe a little bit more, and I'm going to start with you, uh, Lauren, uh, on the whole concept of the value of higher education. Uh, last year in my State of Higher Education Address, I actually talked about this paradox between a growing need for higher education and also a growing skepticism about its value. And there are lots of reasons that we can talk about why that would be. Um, it, but what we know is that 99% of the new jobs that were created post-recession required some new jobs required some sort of education beyond high school. Um, so when you think, and obviously you've, you've given us an example through this rural initiative, and you can reflect on that or other things about higher education, what is it that we need to do to uh, engage more effectively with Hoosiers so that they um, believe that higher education is important to them and is important to our state? Well, wh I want to just start with the commission's efforts because one of the things that I, I've uh, valued the most about the commission is its approach to higher education as an ecosystem. It, and part of the skepticism, I think, that um, our fellow citizens have about higher education comes from the idea that the only way to engage with higher education is to engage with something like Indiana University Bloomington, a traditional four-year residential campus. So I think that if uh, one of the most important things we can do to overcome that skepticism is to be visibly working together so that we are presenting the right educational opportunities at the right time to every one of our, our citizens, not just the students who are headed to an institution like mine, but every one of them. I think the other thing that is important for, at least for me, given the kind of institution that we have, is to make sure that the citizens of the state are benefiting from the work that happens on our campus. And so we, we are uh, highly residential, but also very high research, one of only 62 um, very, very high research institutions in the country. That, that research should be visibly helpful to the entire population of our state. And that's, that's the other piece of what we're trying to do through this rural initiative is make sure that when we have an opportunity uh, to bring a grant to Indiana University Bloomington that's going to do something like uh, make sure that elderly people can stay in their homes for maybe as much as a decade longer with technology, that that work is done in our state and in our communities. That takes uh, constant effort and we're just going, we just stay on that. Um, I, I'd like John and Blair to respond at what you think about what you hear about the value of higher ed. But I did want to put in a plug. Our faculty conference this year, which is in February, uh, is actually going to focus on, uh, the, we have a faculty member on the commission, and, we're, and it is her choice this year to have us really look at community engagement. And for the first year, we're going to be giving uh, a, a award to faculty um, who actually have distinguished themselves about the work that they do in the classroom and how it relates to communities. This will be the first time we've done that. But John first, and then uh, uh, Blair, what do you think about this whole idea of increasing the value of higher education uh, to communities? Well. That's a great question. Um, I actually recall 12 years ago spending a great deal of time going around our entire region talking to not only community leaders, but parents and um, students as well. And one of the things that we heard from communities specifically is that uh, there was a worry that if, and I know this sounds crazy, but you all know this, if a student a child, a young adult, an adult becomes better educated, they'll leave. 
they'll leave the community, they'll leave home. And that's, um, it's real. And so uh, by bringing together the business community, government, public policy, education, all into to coordination together to help uh, in traditional age students, help parents understand that um, that may be the case that some students do leave. But in our case in Southeast Indiana, the vast majority of the students who pursue and receive a uh, higher education credential actually stay in the area and certainly stay in Indiana. And there's data to support that over and over and over again. So um, I was, as a uh, child of two educators, I was shocked at that, um, that worry among parents, but I also get it that, um, especially having spent a lot of time now with people in communities all over the state and beyond, that that is uh, something that if we can engage the business community and community people with educators, none of us can do this alone, if we can work together to help parents and to help students understand uh, how education leads to economic prosperity, uh, that's a great thing. And while some children may leave home, a lot of them actually come back. There's a lot of data to support that too. Do you think, John, that this, uh, the, the, that thinking regionally now, which we have started doing more in Indiana, as opposed to thinking in just 92 county lines, that, that, that it has provided options for people to say, yes, I would like to live in this area, and it may cross a county line, but I can still live here and have a good job someplace else. Do you think this regional way of approaching things is helping that issue that you raised? Yes, absolutely. Great question. And there's no doubt that by um, folks coming together, uh, blurring, if not dissolving the county lines, is helping um, people, all people, understand the great opportunity for uh, a job next door. Uh, this is a very, uh, I happen to know the commuting patterns of virtually every part of the state. It's a very mobile um, state. People drive 45 to 65 minutes to work. Lots of people do. So by regionalizing things, it also helps employers uh, and educators figure things out together that they might not have figured out to alone. Because none of our communities, I said it earlier, I'll say it again, are islands. We, we really, um, in Columbus, 13,000 people come to, to come to work every day. So should we care about Jennings County? Yes. Decatur County? Yes. On and on. We must care about people and um, communities beyond our geographic boundaries that were created how long ago? <laughs> a long time ago. Blair? There was a, a great phrase that an educator used at a uh, panel I was a part of a couple weeks ago where they said that uh, kids can't be what they can't see. And so that, that really informs some of the thought process that we've had around uh, thinking around that, the, the value of education attainment and communicating that value that if they can't see what these different types of careers may be, that it's really hard to uh, embody that, that sort of mindset of I, I want to pursue this education opportunity uh, and certainly then for their parents as well. And so as you think about many of the businesses that we have across our state of which we have a wide array doing really really creative things, but how often do we really know what it is that they do? That oftentimes they do this, this tremendous work inside the confines of, of walls that may or may not have windows with, with logos that may or may not communicate what it is that they're doing. And so it's really tough to understand that I could have this, this incredible career doing amazing things if you don't know that that's what happens uh, in these different areas, let alone then being able to plan for how to get the educational experience you need to step into a career that you don't know that you can have. Uh, and so that's where I, I really want to commend uh, many folks across the state who are, are working on this locally, regionally already, and certainly the, the Governor's Workforce Cabinet has, to has tried to dig into this a little bit further with our career navigation and uh, coaching action team that uh, we put forward some recommendations around a continuum that we defined as engage, explore, experience with really starting earlier with students to be able to engage them in the K through five 
live space around in age appropriate manners around this is what work looks like these are kind of the general tenets of of work overall and then starting to engage in in what the different types of of work areas may be and in industry areas and then moving in the six through eight space into the uh, explore aspect so that you can start to explore what these different industries are and start to think about is this something where i might see myself fitting into or maybe not fitting into if that's something that uh, i had originally thought might be of interest but no not maybe maybe not for me so that then by 9 through 12 we've got students that are starting to experience uh, what some of these different career areas are uh, to then be able to start building some of those uh, credentials that they need uh, to be able to to take advantage of these these great careers and uh, I, I think that really critical along the way is to to decide, to share that there's there's not any one specific path that you have to take to be able to to pursue these different careers. And I get slightly concerned that as, as I hear some of the conversation uh, across the, the state that, they'll, that I'll hear people say, you know, not everybody needs to go to college. Well, I, I understand there are certainly great um, career opportunities that you don't need a four-year degree for, but we know more and more that you're going to need something beyond high school, and you're going to need a, a certificate, an industry certificate of some sort, or a two-year degree, or a four-year degree, or, or beyond, and certainly the numbers bear up uh, that the on the whole, the more education that you have, then uh, the greater your financial opportunities are, particularly to be able to weather disruptions within the within the economy overall and so as as we're able to relay sort of some different pathways to be able to uh, to know that these different careers are available to understand that there's there's different ways to go about it and also thinking about that along that path it's not necessarily having to pick an either or of of you start a career instead of going to college or that that there are ways that you get stackable credentials along this pathway so that it also helps to to reduce some of the stigma I think that sometimes is felt by uh, by very well intentioned parents who want for uh, their kids to be able to to take advantage of some some higher wage positions or or some some uh, some jobs that may require a four-year degree but that may not always be what the student wants to pursue that then if we can communicate the the different pathways as a part of these are the career opportunities for you that may best fit your interests, your skill sets, your aptitude overall, then I think that that helps uh, get at some of the, like I said, the very well-intentioned um, challenges that can be along the way for, for individuals that are having conversations with future workforce and certainly for then being able to, to break down barriers for individuals who are in the workforce who uh, need to then have some greater awareness about what different opportunities may be for them, that if they can't see it, then they don't know uh, that these are, are opportunities ahead and how do they know to then pursue those educational uh, and skill building opportunities uh, to then slot into the growing types of positions that we're seeing coming forward. So we've talked a lot about the role of colleges and universities you know, to a certain extent, policymakers and people who are making decisions and community leaders. Uh, John, I'd like to go to you first and ask you the question about uh, what is the role of employers? And, and we know that this, you know, relationship between education and employment is more inextricably linked than ever. Uh, and we hear, I mean, some of what I think Blair hears when she's around the state from some employers, you know, we just need people so badly, we have all these openings. Um, but what is the responsibility of employers in terms of transitioning and scaling up people? And then, uh, uh, Lauren, I would like to have you talk a little bit about what is the responsibility of higher education for continuous and lifelong learning for people? Well, that's a tall order. <laughs> um, so one of the hats I've worn in the past, I was a human resource executive at Cummins, and um, I'm still in very good standing there. I work with Cummins folks virtually every day, every week. Um, and I personally had the responsibility to hire a lot of people. And so I just continue to have that kind of thing in the back of my mind. 
business uh, people who believe in true partnership are the business people and business organizations that are going to not only survive but thrive in the long run. And to punctuate that, when um, some of us in our team walk into a community, uh, we can pretty much tell whether there's true partnership or customer-supplier relationship. And so most of you are educators in the room. Um, when the business person says, I just need people, you need to get me more people, I don't care how you get me more people, just get me more people, that's not exactly the kind of example of true partnership. Most businesses are becoming more and more enlightened as to uh, the fact that I live here, I work here, uh, the employees that are my responsibility live here, work here, their children are growing up here, so how do we better connect uh, into the societal concerns of poverty, of hunger, of all those things, and I'm not speaking like Pollyannishly here. We work with companies who get this and the ones who actually understand that they need to come alongside educators and educators coming alongside uh, business people to figure out these pathways, uh, to figure out ways to help um, more students be successful as they're working because most adult students are working while they're pursuing higher education. Uh, that the more that those parties work together, the more success there will be. And I could go on about this forever. I've seen it, I've lived it, and, and uh, keep an eye on the companies who truly believe in what we call true partnership. They're not treating educators as suppliers, true partners. And if you wanna know more about that, come to me later, I'm out. <laughs> So that kind of investment in your that kind of investment in your workforce, uh, I think, actually builds uh, the kind of place where employees have loyalty to those kinds of employers. And um, so employers have an obligation. Is we've always said that higher education is about lifelong learning. You could argue that's probably not been true in the past in the same way that you know people would get a degree and it was done and you were finished. How do you see that changing? Well, two ways. I want to just wildly agree with John. And, and I know that um, Blair would agree with it too because of her work in, in Laporte, even before the current position, everything is connected to everything else. And so you, you can't work on one little piece, you can't work on workforce development and not think about quality of place. You, know, you can't think about quality of place without thinking about social service. So it is all connected to every, you know, everything's connected to everything else. And I, I think there are two, two quick things I'd like to say about lifelong learning. First, some of that learning has to take place in the academy. I think my institution in the last six or seven years has gotten very good at moving quickly towards uh, revamping curricula, adding certificates, doing the kinds of things that are focused on the needs that people have right now for different kinds of education. And that, that's an important thing for a big institution like IU because traditionally academics are not thought of as being the quickest, most uh, quickest when it comes to, to thinking about curriculum um, revamping and looking outwards towards the needs of the state, the region, and the nation. But on the flip side, I think we have to recognize that all of us are in a world in which we, we will need different skills as we move through our lives, and often we'll need different credentials. So we'll get done with a, a bachelor's degree and we'll need to be able to get a master's degree, in fact, Many people are arguing that master's degrees are the new bachelor's degrees. <laughs> and so figuring out ways to assure that students can get through to a master's degree more quickly if that's the path they need, getting certificates that are, that are um, stackable and fit together in different ways has been a big focus of mine during the last several years. And there's been a really big focus on um, 
I, in IU Online on assuring that we have the kinds of credentials that people will need as they go through their lives. You know, you may have graduated from college at a point where cybersecurity wasn't even a thing. Now it's a huge thing. And being able to go online and get a master's in cybersecurity at this point, you know, for many business professionals is a huge deal. So that kind of accessibility is going to be necessary for my institution, but, but for all of us in all of the spaces where we work, where we make credentials a little bit more accessible at different points in people's lives. You have a comment? Well, I would just add on that uh, kind of tying the, the two themes together that for the, the higher education institutions, and I got to give a lot of credit to our, our higher ed uh, institutions across the state, that I think that it's been really fascinating to see how the, the different schools are working to become more nimble and, and to really try and think differently about how they're offering uh, different types of, of instruction mediums and, and to be able to meet different uh, types of students in different ways and, and points in their life. And uh, the, the, that we are seeing much more creativity come out of our, our higher ed institutions. They need feedback from our employers to be able to understand what are the skills that you need taught to be able to, to meet the demands of your business, particularly as that's shifting faster and faster for, for these businesses because the, the technology keeps changing um, so rapidly. And so to, to think even further about some of, of John's point, that there needs to be uh, continued engagement from our employer community with our, our schools, with our, our higher ed institutions, as well as K through 12 around what are the, the different skills coming forward that, that you see, because we can't know uh, necessarily without that feedback, because we're not, we're not living this every day. Uh, so the regular conversation is really critical. So we have a few minutes left, and I want to have the last question really be about culture of a state uh, and a culture that education beyond high school was certainly not essential to, to have a good job and take care of your families. If you look at our, the relationship, if you look at our 92 counties and the relationship between education attainment and per capita income, it's pretty clear that education matters more than ever. How do, in each of your spheres, and, and you may have reflected upon this already, so this is an opportunity for some closing comments. What are you engaged in to make sure that Hoosiers understand what they need to do so that they won't be left behind, either in their areas of the state or in, with their families, as this transition to an information age and, and education beyond high school becomes more important? That people who made very rational decisions in the past have to pivot their thinking to a new way if they want to make sure that their children and their grandchildren have opportunities. What are you doing to help us shift that thinking in Indiana? And anyone can start who would like to. You have the mic, so if we want to just come down this way. All right, I'll, uh, I'll kick us off with our last remarks here. Uh, one of the pieces that I'm really excited about is that uh, we have an opportunity that uh, the Career Connections and Talent Team is uh, coordinating with the Indiana Economic Development Corporation as well as Civic Lab uh, to help cultivate, uh, as, as you heard today, uh, the, the system within uh, regions across the state. And so we are uh, piloting the 21st Century Talent Regions Initiative in at least 12 communities or 12 regions across the state of, of building out that system model of ensuring that we're engaging all the different uh, pieces and, and partners of K through 12, higher education, businesses, workforce development, economic development, uh, local regional government entities to be uh, a part of a, a common conversation with one another, looking at common metrics and setting common goals uh, for one another to ensure that we are we're fortifying that ecosystem for uh, individuals to have awareness around the, the different types of jobs and then uh, the then being able to take advantage of training and, and slotting into those positions. And uh, we're identifying outcomes around the, the system elements of uh, raising
raising educational attainment levels, raising household income, and growing our population. Uh, so we're looking at the talent attraction, talent development, uh, and, and talent connections across the pipeline. So very excited for the work coming forward uh, with the 21st century talent regions. As am I. <laughs> mm -hmm. I. I think the most important thing that all of our excellent um, higher education institutions can be engaged in right now is visibility in communities. The point that Blair made a few minutes ago about kids not being able to be what they can't see is true for every, every institution of higher education in this state. If my students are now not visible in communities and my faculty are not visible in communities around the state, then they're not showing the students of the future that you have a path to my institution. And I think I'm very excited that you're going to have a focus on community engagement coming up. I think it is the critical thing that institutions need to be doing right now. Well, as a community engagement person, I'm really excited and um, frankly, the commission as well as um, IU and Blair's group all focused on uh, community engagement. Um, I would close by saying this, uh, the work that you all do is vital to serve students, each and every student as human beings not as numbers is really really important uh, you brought up equity i have to admit we're trying to understand equity in a deeper and deeper way how can we help every human being in indiana and we'll just stay there in indiana right now in every community uh, understand the opportunities that they have and also to be of service to every student disabled students, students of color, students of poverty, and students uh, in general. And I mean that sincerely. The more that we can help each student understand um, how he or she can move forward in a community, in a region, in a state is, is truly vital. I've seen the care and concern of educators, of policymakers, of business people, of community people. Uh, I'm trying to understand because as this, uh, one of the, the uh, partnership health uh, uh, technical assistance providers to Lumina and now teaming up with Blair and her team and uh, Indiana Economic Development Corporation, this 21st century talent regions initiative, uh, I'm really thinking a lot about uh, equity. There's a group we work with called the uh, uh, National Equity Project out of Oakland. Uh, they're teaching us, but I think collectively um, we got to think about every human being and what their potential is and help them. And I know that's what most of you do every day, and I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. Oh, you got a mic. <laughs> well, I, I think with that we're closing on the point that I think we all agree about that this this is our responsibility, this is our obligation for all of us who are in the room. Uh, and so we've had a great way to start the conference. Uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking each of our panelists for their participation today, but much more importantly for what they do every day as they work in this arena. Thank you.